I am Jean Ladding, one of the coordinators of Healing the Heart of America at the Unity of Houston. I'm also a member of the Healing the Heart of America book club. Our book club read a book that we found so unique and so impactful that we wanted to get it into many hands as possible. And that's what brings us all here today. The book, of course, is to some of us what racism costs everyone and how we can prosper together by Heather McGee. The premise of the book is that racism has hurt not only people of color, but white people as well. She explains how we can all benefit from finding ways to live, learn, and work together. The zero sum game is considered by many to provide the foundation of what it means to enjoy the benefits of America, but it doesn't have to be. Here is Zelda Benson of the Unity of Tustin, all the way from California to tell us more about that. Um, so what is that zero sum? Basically the zero sum is this false theory that there's only so much of a pie to go around. Meaning that if they win, we lose or if we win, they lose. So um, this idea of the zero sum is something that we're actually seeing um, happening in now in a lot of our politics, that there's no more cooperation and trying to seek common ground and, and more benefit for all of us. It is a more of a game of zero sum, which if you win, I lose, or if I win, you have to lose. And that's also kind of played out in this cartoon here. Uh, with two dogs talking, it's not enough that we succeed. Cats must fail. <laughs> what we're really trying to seek is a solidarity dividend. How can we gain more by our cooperation and understanding? How can we, by boosting some of us um, up, we can expand more and both whites and blacks will have more prosperous lives. And that's so much in line with our unity principles about um, not having that um, uh, um, scarcity mentality. So what we want to seek is your interest, my interest, and how can we come together in our common interest to both achieve more? Heather McGee says, I learned that although we knew about white people, even if we didn't, if we didn't live with them, they were co-workers, school administrators, and of course every image on screen, segregation meant that white people didn't know much about us at all. For all the ways that segregation is aimed at limiting the choices of people of color, it's white people who are ultimately isolated. This presentation is brought to you today by these six women who have been working on this for the last few months. And I just really want to content to, um, Say thank you to Mary and Pam, Elise, Jean, and Linda for bringing this to you today. I want to introduce our next presenter. It is widely known that people of color do not have the same advantages as white people in this country in areas of education and healthcare, economic opportunities, and so forth. A lot of people, though, don't understand how the country's public policies laid the foundation for this to happen. And fewer still understand how ver these very policies that created inequalities for people of color also harmed and are continuing to harm white people. Pam will summarize Heather McGee's uh, explanation about this. Thank you, Zelda. Let's start with racial resentment at what price? The zero sum story of racial hierarchy. Before moving forward as a nation, it is crucial that Americans understand the underpinnings of the current inequality. The zero sum story of racial hierarchy was born along with the country. It was created to justify our original economic policies, which were stolen people, land and labor. It is an invention of people who gained power through exploitation and kept it by sowing constant division, a divide and conquer strategy. It has always benefited the few while limiting the potential of the rest and therefore the whole. 
American citizenship became aligned with freedom and whiteness, shutting out and dehumanizing people of color. Black men were depicted as ferocious animals, while Native Americans were called savages and wolves. We carry that bias forward today as we hear immigrants referred to as rapists and murderers who bring disease. We listened on live TV as the defense attorney for the killers of Ahmaud Aubrey described the victim this way. He wore no socks to cover his long, dirty toenails. We are still dehumanizing people of color and in, in a need to make them seem savage or animalistic. For zero-sum thinking to work, there must be an us and a them. Zero-sum thinking is fed by stoking fear and insecurity. Generational wealth. A nation's well-being depends upon a sense of cooperation, informed by the knowledge that no individual can accomplish alone what the nation can achieve collectively. However, throughout American history, socioeconomic benefits have often been available to whites only, thereby creating generational wealth. With the Homestead Act of 1862 and its 1866 counterpart, only 6,000 Black families were able to become part of the 1.6 million landowners who gained deeds. Today, 46 million people are property descendants of the Homestead Act beneficiaries. During the Great Depression, red do not lend lines were drawn around almost every black neighborhood in the country, which excluded them from affordable loans, more affordable loans with tax, deduct tax deductible interest. They were deemed bad credit risk without any substantiation of that claim. The New Deal transformed the lives of workers with minimum wage and overtime laws, but compromises with Southern lawmakers excluded the jobs most black people held in domestic and agricultural work. The GI Bill of 1944 paid college tuition and living expenses of thousands of veterans, catapulting a generation of white males into professional careers while most black veterans were funneled to vocational schools. The federal government created suburbs by investing in highway systems and subsidizing private developers while demanding racial covenants that prevented black people from buying in them with white only clauses. Although unenforceable in Houston and throughout Texas, the deeds of many homes still contain that restrictive language today. Social security gave income to millions of elderly citizens, but by excluding certain job categories, most black workers were left out. Union doors were closed to non-white workers until the 1960s. The advantages accumulated by white people were free and bestowed an elevated status that seemed innate. Let's see how racism literally drained the pool and what that has cost us all. By World War II, 2000 public pools had been built across the nation. When public pool use was integrated in the 50s, Closings happened across the country. Others were allowed to fall into disrepair. The Fairground Park Pool in St. Louis, Missouri, boasting a capacity of 10,000 swimmers and one of the most prized public pools in the world, permanently closed to avoid integration. In Montgomery, Alabama, the Oak Park Pool was drained, filled with cement, and paved over. Montgomery went on to close every public park and padlock all the gates. The zoo was closed, animals sold, and the playground equipment removed. Millions of white Americans who once swam for free now had to pay for members only swim clubs. A once public resource became a luxury amenity and entire communities lost out on the many benefits they previously enjoyed. By the 60s, background pools became a trend. And what has that cost us? Homes with pools use 49% more electricity and the average pool contains 20,000 gallons of water. Homes with pools do not recoup the cost upon selling 
and contribute to ozone pollution. Next slide, okay. Um, what are we going without? Let's start with education. With no perceived need to invest in education or public works to raise the general standard of living, the slave economy lowered land values. Still today, Southern states suffer. Nine of the 10 poorest states are in the South, as are seven out of 10 states with the least educational attainment. I'd like to share a personal story regarding my own educational struggles in a deep South state. I grew up in North Louisiana and struggled to make good grades. I was never offered guidance or help, no matter how often I asked. Since the principal chose me to represent our school at Girl State, and I was selected by the teacher's advisory group to be student liaison, I had face-to-face -face opportunities. The answer was always some version of, keep up the good work, honey, you'll get it. In my senior session with the school counselor, she asked what I wanted to do after graduation. And of course I answered, I plan to attend college. Her response, I'm sorry, dear, but you aren't college material. You'll make a good secretary though. In my life, I've hobbled together ways of overcoming, but the struggle is real. At 50 years of age, a fierce and dedicated educator friend in New York suggested I get tested. I discovered my multiple learning deficits would have been easily corrected as a child if I had not grown up in the second worst state for recognizing, diagnosing, and treating learning disabilities. It still holds that place today. Public university education was once considered a benefit for the common good until enrollment of people of color reached 40%. And then suddenly anti-government sentiment rose as white American taxpayers rallied against handouts such as affordable college degrees. Because college degrees are necessary to compete for middle-class jobs, students still must graduate, but at a great financial cost. Since 1991, the average cost for college tuition has nearly tripled due to withering government commitments causing skyrocketing student debts. The federal government also shifted from grants with no repayment to loans with compounding interest. Both students of color and white students have taken on crippling debt. Often the debt is such a large portion of their postgraduate income, they cannot afford to buy a home or start a family. In our own family, six out of 10 of my nieces and nephews do not own homes. All but one have college degrees and have spouses with college degrees. They are all in their mid thirties. As for college tuition, our granddaughter graduated this past December from LSU at a cost of 120,000. But in 1977, when college was considered for the greater good, the cost of her grandfather's degree, my husband, at the University of Missouri was only $10,000. And what about going out, going without in healthcare? Healthcare is another example of what should be a collective endeavor, but sadly America has resisted universal solutions and even labeled the effort socialist. Many states like Texas have needlessly crippled rural hospitals by their refusal to adopt accompanying reforms of the Affordable Care Act. Over the last seven years, 120 rural hospitals have closed, 26 in Texas. It eliminates one out of seven jobs in those communities and makes access to medical treatment difficult for all. One fourth of those remaining hospitals are at risk of closure. In Medicaid, the states that expanded, hundreds of thousands of working class citizens went from being uninsured to being able to afford doctor care. Stable Medicaid funding has allowed rural medical clinics in expansion states to thrive. Texas has the worst in the nation healthcare coverage. There are over 1 million white non-Hispanic Texans without any healthcare coverage. An income of a mere $4,000 makes you ineligible for Medicaid. Texas is only 41% white, but the legislature is 67% white and 75% male, not representative of its constituents. Texas politicians claim that benefits would bring freeloaders out of the woodwork 
like bugs. In stigmatizing those who would take advantage of the benefits, poor white citizens cannot then support these benefits for themselves, lest they be forced to share the stigma. So we end where we began and never left with zero sum thinking. As we go into our breakout room, we have posed two questions. Number one is, what surprised you in this, in this presentation? And also, what did you already know? And perhaps how the presentation expanded your knowledge. And we'd love to hear your personal stories. So we're gonna have a very brief debrief. And I like CNN comments. CNN style comments so we can get as many in as possible from what you discussed. That means try to keep it to one sentence, two at max. And please either raise your hand or you can do the little hand thing under reactions and we'll all scout. Okay, Zelda. I mean, Pam. Yes, go, Pam. Uh, Jolene was in, I believe I'm saying that right. Jolene was in my group and I just heard the shocking information that as a teacher in Texas, there are no unions, so they are not provided health care as a teacher in the state of Texas. Wow. I had no idea. My, uh, she moved here from, I don't see her on my screen, so I have a little iPad. Um, my sister, she came from Missouri. My uh, sister-in-laws are teachers in Missouri. And of course, they have excellent uh, health care. So that was shocking. The state of Texas, no health care for teachers. Wow. Wow. Yes, I just saw somebody's hands and then I clicked uh, something. Well, I'm kind of surprised to hear that because I used to be a teacher in, in the state of Texas. And I did have, it was a long time ago, and I did have health care when I taught. And so I'm kind of, are you saying, whoever said that, are you saying that? It's me. That there, and, I, and, I worked, uh, and I worked at Fort Worth ISD in the Employee Benefits Office, and we had insurance for everybody. So did I Delaney. understand? Or, yes. Delaney, I'm where here. are you? You're, you're I have my hand raised. Oh, yes. I do have a comment. There was nothing of, of surprise to me at all. I have lived through most of what the presentation uh, covered. Um, what does surprise me is that in today's society, so many people are willing to turn their heads still and ignore this, 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 these facts and this situation. So the question is, how can we deal with that? And I guess that's a question might not be answered in my lifetime. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question, Sandra, and we are going to keep talking, and at the very end of it, we'll have a tiny thing to say about it, because you just asked a great big question. Okay, the next person is Dylan Maples. If I'm sorry if I said your yes. name wrong. No, that was right. Um, can you see me then? Yes? Yes. Uh, I was the one that was talking about uh, the, the no, you have no ability to be unionized here in the state of Texas. And the way that they get around, um, they provide health care as an option and it is taken out. You get to decide um, here in the state of Texas, uh, well, in, in Houston, let's say. Uh, in HISD and other school districts that I've worked for here in Houston, as opposed to St. Louis, Missouri, where I lived, the difference that they, the way that they can get around it in Texas is it's not the fact that the school doesn't, district doesn't provide you an opportunity to be insured. Um, whereas in, it's a, it's not, um, they don't take it out of your paycheck in other states. It is an actual benefit, and it is something that they give you full health care, dental, vision, um, more than one uh, health care uh, system to pick from. Um, here in Houston, the school districts get to decide on exactly one uh, group health care. And if you want to be, if you want to have health care, you can, but it's directly taken out of your paycheck. That is not the way that it's done in other states. Um, so it takes a, the amount that you actually bring home is so small. If you are 
paying for healthcare, as well as you, if you want dental, if you want vision, if you want life insurance, if you want um, anything like that, um, they don't match any of your retirement here. Uh, in other uh, places, they Thank do you. that. And I know that uh, in our uh, group, the thing that stood out to me is, of course, I was not surprised by all the, the data that was shared. But what to me is ironic is, as I look at all this group and I listen, I'm assuming that no one else is really surprised either. And that we're all here because we're sympathetic and understanding to this situation. And to me, the I'm a, a retired teacher. And so I tend to look at solutions to problems like this through the lens of a educator. And to me, the problem is None of us really need this education. We've already got it. It's the people who are, let's say, voting against their own self-interest because they've been hypnotized or deluded into thinking that, you know, that they've got to maintain their status quo as white people or people of privilege and uh, resist any uh, changes because they've been convinced that it's socialistic, it's, you know, they, they're going to lose their white power, their white privilege. And how do you reach those people? I doubt that this program is going to reach those people. So I'm in this uh, dilemma of, dang, this is great, but how do you get to those people who are deluded? <laughs> that's it. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, Natasha, we'll have to catch you the next mm -hmm. time. Uh, I just want to respond quickly to Robert. Sandy Newkirk is here. And what I'm about to say, I first heard from her. Each one, teach one. And so that's the philosophy in which we are offering this. And I, this is how I, one of the things I'm going to say at the conclusion, each one, teach one, share the wealth of the information. So now we're going to hear from Linda Patterson to share Heather McGee's research on how a zero-sum belief system a, what, uh, uh, a scarcity mentality, as Zelda called it, has impacted our economy, our democracy, and our psychological well-being. It also has impacted our freedom and opportunities to live and work together as we please. Linda. Hi, everybody. Very limited time, and I have a lot to say, so I'll get right into it. The subprime mortgage crisis of 2008 was the most dramatic event in the life of the nation since the Great Depression, ushering in the period known as the Great Recession. 5.6 million homeowners lost their homes to foreclosure during this crisis. Associated losses included 19.2 trillion in household wealth and 8 million jobs. Families headed by millennials who entered adulthood during the Great Recession still have 34% less wealth than previous generations. They will likely never catch up. Although homeowners of color were represented out of proportion to their numbers in society, the majority of these foreclosed homes belong to white people. The precursor to this event was the marketing of subprime loans, primarily to black and brown families during the 90s and early 2000s. A wave of deregulation in the 90s had resulted in an explosion of unregulated mortgage brokers and holding companies, an unchecked growth of predatory loans and financial products such as houses bought on contract. The public policy justification for allowing subprime loans was that they made the American dream of home ownership possible for people who did not meet the credit standards to get a cheaper prime mortgage. But these loans started to be aggressively and deceptively marketed to people who could have qualified for less expensive prime loans, and then to existing homeowners as refinancing loans. From 1998 to 2006, less than 10% of these loans were for first time home buyers. Instead of getting striving people into home ownership, the loans often wound up pushing existing homeowners out. The earliest victims of these practices, disproportionately black, were the canaries in the coal mine, but their warnings went unheeded. Bank regulators and federal policymakers were well aware of what was happening in communities of color 
but did nothing to stop the new lenders and their new tactics. Lenders, brokers, and investors targeted people of color because they thought they could get away with it. Because of racism, they could. The predatory practices were allowed to continue until the disaster had engulfed white communities too. And only then, far too late, was it recognized as an emergency. The systems set up to exploit one part of society rarely stay contained. Moving from our shared economy to our shared democracy, Heather McGee maintains that our democracy is even less equal than our economy and the two inequalities are mutually reinforcing. McGee reminds us that the anti-democratic concept of minority rule and rule by only the wealthiest of white men, in fact, was the original design of American government. The constitution of the United States wasn't written with an affirmative right to vote for all. It's always been a power struggle to create a representative electorate. One way to secure slave states ratification of the constitution was the institution of the electoral college, which was designed to give slave states an advantage in electing the president. The electoral college today overrepresents white people, but not all white people benefit. The advantage accrues to white people who live in whiter, less populated states. White people who live in larger, more diverse states are underrepresented. Another obstacle to creating truly representative electorate is voter suppression. This age old racist tactic is now useful against a broad base of white people who could be in a multiracial coalition with people of color. White voters end up being collateral damage in a trap not set for them. Efforts to diminish black and brown political participation have also limited the choices and voices of poorer white Americans and thwarted working class coalitions that could have made economic and social life richer for all. A genuine, truly representative democracy is still an aspiration in America. In one of the final chapters of the book called The Hidden Wound, Heather McGee outlines the moral, psychological and spiritual costs of racism for white people. I wish I had time to go into detail here, but some of these costs include religious confusion, moral conflict, and self-delusion. Religious confusion in white Christians, for example, arises <clears throat> from the disconnect between the teachings of Jesus and the lack of attention paid by our churches to the evil of racism, as well as the history of the American church's complicity with white supremacy and the ongoing reality of systemic racism in our church communities. Moral conflict arises from the fact that no one wants to feel that they benefit from a system that hurts others. Denial is a seemingly easy way to avoid this discomfort, but sustaining such denial in the face of reality, in Heather McGee's words, actually requires unrelenting psychological exertion. The denial mindset leads to self-delusion. Two of the most pernicious examples of this are the myth of meritocracy, which seeks to absolve white people from any responsibility for the disparities we see all around us, and the notion that colorblindness is either possible or to be desired. Note that these costs are borne not only by white people who are overtly racist, but to all of us by virtue of the fact that we live on one side of a line in a highly segregated and unequal society. White people of all races in America share an economy and a democracy, however unequally. Oh, wow, people, sorry. We mostly do not share our neighborhoods and schools. Although no longer overtly enforced by law, segregation is still a defining feature of our landscape. Contrary to our collective memory, segregation in America didn't originate in the South, nor was it ever confined to the Jim Crow states. Jim Crow laws and their precursors in the North were instituted by the white power structure as a reaction to the threat of class solidarity. They reasoned that everyday physical separation would be the most powerful way to ensure the allegiance of the white masses to race over class. Few people today understand the extent to which governments at every level 
forced Americans to live apart throughout our history and the extent to which that legacy is still with us. No governments in modern history, save apartheid South Africa and Nazi Germany, have segregated as well as the United States has, with precision and under the color of law. And even then, both the Third Reich and the Afrikaner government looked to America's laws to create their systems. A cornerstone of building wealth in American families has been a housing market built on two major investments, the 30-year mortgage and the federal government's willingness to guarantee banks' issuance of these loans. But these investments were made on a whites-only basis and under conditions of segregation. The results of these decisions are still very much with us today. To the last point, in recent In, I'm sorry. In recent polls, the majority of white people said that they regularly come into contact with only a few African Americans. Only a few African Americans. 75% reported that their social network is entirely white, and 21% reported that they seldom or never interact with any people of color at all. Most white people in the housing market will say that they want to live in racially integrated communities, and yet they do not. In Heather McGee's words, white people are the most segregated people in America, whether they want to be or not. Uh, could we go back to slide 16, the one I skipped, Zelda? Thank you. Today's segregation is driven by less obviously racially targeted policies such as exclusionary zoning laws. While excluding people of color from mostly white neighborhoods, these laws affect everyone. As a result of these laws, working class and many middle-income people of all races are effectively banned from 75% of the residential map in most of America's cities. While segregation is typically thought of as something done to people of color, today's segregation isolates white people most of all. Studies comparing more heavily segregated cities to more integrated cities show that, integration, that segregation results in lost income to workers and to the area's gross domestic product, higher homicide rates and higher costs for public safety, and increased pollution. These costs are borne by all racial demographics in the city. Similarly, studies of integration in schools have linked more integrated schools to a host of positive learning outcomes for white students, as well as all other demographics in the areas of cultural competency, critical thinking and problem solving, civic engagement, and higher academic achievement. The relationship between the continued segregation of our neighborhoods and the unequal funding of our public schools is a self-perpetuating cycle that harms us all. Public policy created the problem of segregation and only public policy can solve it. I want to end with a passage from the book on the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision, which we all learned about in school, most of us anyway. What we didn't learn about it is as important as what we did learn. These are Heather McGee's words. The 1954 Supreme Court decision that could have changed everything, Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, struck down state and local laws that racially segregated public schools and rejected the premise of separate but equal. What led to the historic unanimous decision was disapproval, not of inequality, but of separateness itself. It was segregation and the message it sent, which reinforced the notion of human hierarchy that hurt children more than mere out of date books and unheated classrooms ever could. 32 social science experts submitted an appendix to the appellate brief detailing the damage of segregation to the development of minority children. But there was another path from Brown, one not taken with profound consequences for our understanding of segregation's harms. The nine white male justices ignored a part of the social scientist's appendix that also described in detail the harm segregation inflicts on majority children. 
white children who learned the prejudices of our society, wrote the social scientist, were being taught to gain personal status in an unrealistic and non-adaptive way. They were not required to evaluate themselves in terms of the more basic standards of actual personal ability and achievement. What's more, they often develop patterns of guilt feelings and rationalizations to protect themselves from recognizing the essential injustice of their unrealistic fears and hatreds of the minority groups. The best research of the day concluded that confusion, conflict, moral cynicism, and disrespect for authority may arise in white children as a consequence of being taught principles of justice and fair play by the same persons and institutions who seem to be acting in a prejudiced and discriminatory manner. The now lost rationale for why segregation must fall, the rationale that included the cost to us all, might have actually uprooted segregation in America. After all, arguing that black and brown children suffered from not being with white children affirmed the reality of unequal conditions. But once the argument was divorced from the context of legal segregation, it also subtly reaffirmed the logic of white supremacy. Today, it's that logic that endures, that white segregated schools are better and that everyone, even white children, should endeavor to be in them. In summary, this landmark decision while affirming that separation harms minority children, ignored the equally important truth that separation harms white children. The unintended consequence of this is the subtle affirmation of the depraved logic of white supremacy. We're going to use the same two uh, breakout questions, and uh, but you are absolutely not limited by those. We have 10 minutes to discuss anything you wanna discuss about what you just heard. One sentence to the extent you're able. Uh, who has a comment? And Denise, would you, Janice, I'm sorry, would you call on people for us? Sure. Make sure you go to your reactions at the bottom of the page and raise your electronic hand so that we can see you. That puts you up at the very top of the screen. Nobody has a comment? <laughs> What surprised you folks? What, what, what's one food for thought? Okay, now we got a couple of people here. Okay. Uh, Irina? Hi, thank you. Um, on two sentences, I had not really heard of this idea of separation and segregation of whites being harmful to whites. And, um, but I do equate it to my experience of being raised, born and raised in, in diverse San Francisco, it is such a rich experience, having been exposed to many ethnicities, many religions, many songs, music, and food and languages, helps me be more open and aware of others. And so it's, it, is, it does provide skills to, to reduce fear, really. Anyways, thank oh, you. Thank you. Okay, the next person, Sandy Newkirk. Well, as she just said, living in San Francisco, I've lived in San Francisco, the diversity in everything there opens your eyes. It certainly opened mine in many areas of my life. I had never been around certain cultures or certain lifestyles or anything like that until I would lived in San Francisco. But by design, you know, that uh, California has so many options that Texas and Florida and some other places just simply get closed down. And that is no accident. So uh, uh, what's mind boggling is that um, this is not universally known or recognized or that the people know what to do about it once they do recognize it. It's that same thing. Each one can teach one, uh, Dr. Jean, yes, but uh, which ones and where and how long and what can I do after that one and how do I do it best and what do I expect from them? I could go on and on, but thank you. Okay, one last comment. Okay, Donna Cullum. Hey there. Um, yeah, so I, I have to put in a, a note about Houston. Uh, as you know, it's the um, it's considered the most uh, diverse 
city in the United States right now. And uh, the way my kids grew up uh, in Spring Branch, what I call Spring Branch USA, <laughs> I mean, uh, we, we were, my, you know, I mentioned that my kids, uh, that my house was regularly looked like the UN. I mean, it was, it was very, very diverse. And, and in the neighborhood, we, you know, we were exposed to a lot of diverse uh, food and music and, and, you know, just different thought. And I feel like um, that people who put their kids in these lily white environments and don't expose them to all these things are really robbing them of, of, of opportunities for growth in, in so many different ways. And my daughters, uh, actually one of them lives in New York and the other one lived for years in San Francisco, just moved back here. But um, they were very well equipped, I think, to deal with these uh, very diverse uh, communities uh, on, the, on the coast as well um, because, of, uh, because of that. And I, and I think more so than a lot of people who who are quote unquote protected in these protected environments, which 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 rob them so much of so much um, diversity and thought and and everything and and uh, uh, Donna, yes, I don't want to keep. I'm trying to not keep people. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm uh, yeah, I'm probably done. Finish that gonna... one thought. One okay. sentence. No, I just think it's a it's an opportunity to. Um, you know, for my kids to certainly for my kids to have had uh, exposure to a, a lot of richness in their lives. Great. So thank you. So Zelda, we're moving on. Raise it. What could we all gain from living in a truly integrated and equitable society? How could harnessing the talent and potential of diverse voices in all of our institutions benefit us? Most importantly, and this is what Robert Phelps had to say. This was his question. How can we bring about this transformation? Here is Elise Coffey to tell us what Heather McGee calls the solidarity dividend. Hello, everyone. George Goel, he's head of People's Action. That's a grassroots network that organizes in rural America. He said, we found the enemy and it's not each other. The current rules of the game allow a small minority of participants to capture most of the gains. This allows fewer people to play at all. An example is how currently the entire middle class owns less than the wealthiest 1% of Americans. American inequality is rampant in the United States. It is hard for anybody, especially Blacks, to climb the hierarchy to success. Heather McGee said, we're all at the bottom of the drain swimming pool. Consider where we are today. We have crises of climate change causing wildfires, rising sea levels and drought. There's inequality in housing, education, healthcare, and employment. Pandemic relief was unevenly distributed nationally and internationally in the last two years. Poor neighborhoods lacked early vaccine access, experienced unsafe working conditions in their necessary services jobs, and experienced a higher level of job loss during the pandemic. Blacks and Latinos suffered from COVID deaths at a higher rate than their white counterparts during the early days of the pandemic. Two major results from this. We were all exposed to unvaccinated people and many people, black and white, couldn't get needed surgeries or medical treatment. A brain drain on people choosing to work in the public sector or education due to low wages is not good. This deprives all communities from benefiting from some of our brightest minds and our children from being exposed to some of our most creative thinkers. The 2019 Federal Reserve Report, as Pam shared earlier, high student loans cause many young people to delay marriage, buy homes and have families. 
Student debt robs too many people of the means to start businesses, invest in their families, or invent new ideas and solutions. Lack of opportunity robs the entire economy. Statistics indicate that crime and education are inversely correlated. Research shows that people in our prisons are disproportionately black. Among other crimes, a large number of them have committed robbery. This has created a fear of blacks and resulted in a high level of spending to secure homes with deadbolt locks, alarms, and neighborhood security patrols. Better, more equitable funding for school instruction, equipment, and support services would help prevent these crimes. Crime hurts everyone. Air pollution is a problem in Houston. It affects everyone. Neighborhoods near the Ship Channel and in the Baytown area suffer the emissions from the ships and oil refineries. These neighborhoods are treated as sacrifice zones. This has prompted wealthier neighborhoods on the opposite side of Houston to install air monitoring stations. Not many monitors have been installed in the impacted low-income communities. Growing anti-government sentiment and pushback on government proposals and programs leave many neighborhoods without adequate police protection, school building improvements, and timely trash collection. Whites frequently just move to a more secure neighborhood where their tax dollars support better schools and services. Anti-government sentiment results in falling support for taxes to support failing infrastructure, mass transit, and improved drainage. In Houston, that looks like bridges in need of repair, potholes on major streets, and streets that flood when it rains. Black and white residents feel the impact of driving on these streets. Howard Thurman in his book, Deep is the Hunger said, we cannot fight an idea with threats, investigations, and scares. We can fight an idea only with a greater idea to which in all phases of our life, we are dedicated with high purpose and deep resolve. Solidarity Dividend. Slogan on a t-shirt of a politician in Maine says, I'm not black, but I'll fight for you. Which means that high purpose and deep resolve takes courage. We can begin by learning about our communities. As mentioned before, in Texas, you should look at your homeowner's deed to see if it has a covenant restricting homes from being sold or rented to people of color. We have it here in Houston. Ask and answer the hard questions. Who is an American? Who are the haves and the have nots? Who are we to each other? Only competitors? Recognize that we need each other and that diversity is our biggest asset in education, law, business, and the economy. Work to change the rules and laws to, to disrupt the disproportionate power of the rich that exists in our city, our state, and then the whole USA. Challenge ourselves to live our lives in solidarity, unity across color, origin, age, religion, and class. White people see that the belief, quote, anyone can succeed if they just try hard enough, end quote, is not true. Whites also understand that blacks and whites are not starting out with the same wealth, education, nor employment opportunities. They also learned that despite affirmative action policies, the share of black and brown students at selected colleges has declined over the last 35 years. John Lewis says, start a good fight. 
Are we willing to live our unity principles? Do we believe that blacks deserve to live with less? What are we blind to? What inconvenience are we willing to undertake to bridge the racial divide? What have we done that's contributing to the problem? Are we strong enough to work on this problem? Yes, we need each other. Ask yourself, am I willing to live the unity principles? Do I believe that Blacks deserve to live with less? What am I blind to? What inconvenience am I willing to undertake to bridge the racial divide? What have I done that's contributing to the problem? Am I strong enough to work on this problem? Let diversity be our superpower. So you have different breakout questions this time. What have I been blind to? What have I done that is contributing to the problem? And what could I do differently moving forward? Okay. Maybe I left it on the whole time. Who knows? <laughs> okay, so we're slightly over time. So we want super brief comments. Uh, hands up if you have one. First person's Natasha. Yeah, I was going to say that um, I'm going to try to make this brief. That um, I think that Matter's book is really refreshing from the standpoint that it's trying to shift our mentality away from scarcity to a win-win situation. And then the second thing that I'd like to say is that having this conversation is so uncomfortable that I find that using our unity teachings in terms of the way we treat one another, I hope in my heart of hearts be some form of a light shining that would spark something in the person who we would have treated that maybe, you know, this, the way I felt really touched me and I'd like to treat other people that way. I, I have a problem and this is where I would say that I was, I am guilty of not teaching it because I'm not this kind of preaching kind of a person. I believe that some of the best sermons are the ones not spoken. And so from this standpoint, in terms of teaching this to other people verbally, for me, I would more believe in our unity teachings of, you know, doing it by example, the way you treat people from the janitor all the way to the wealthiest person, irrespective of their color or their origin. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. One more comment. Next person's Mary. Well, actually, it's uh, more of a request. And I was just wondering, I just really grateful for the work that you all have done. And I didn't know if you'd be willing to share your slides with us. Uh, I know that that, that's part of the closeout. They will be available. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And this whole presentation is being recorded so it can be posted to our Unity of Houston website under Healing the Heart of America webpage. So it'll be available uh, shortly. <laughs> On behalf of this amazing, hardworking, dedicated planning team, we thank you all for being here. We have enjoyed just your presence. We enjoyed planning and we hope you will share the wealth. Each one, teach one, find somebody in your life who doesn't know anything that you uh, we've covered today and share it. So uh, you already know, give us time to get the web page up. I'm going to put it in the chat as we speak. For those of you, so you can go directly to the chat. We hope this overview entices you to read the book. And for those of you who live in Houston, it's available at the Unity of Houston Bookstore for your convenience. Some of you wonder what's next. We definitely want to preserve the momentum 
you'll be hearing from us. Meanwhile, consider the book club. club. Just real quick, we have uh, determined that on March 2nd at 6.30 p.m., we're going to have a Zoom for those who are interested, not only Unity of Tustin, but any of you, about how we can take some next steps. And in order to get the Zoom link for that, um, I've posted it in. It's up a little bit ways now. Uh, it is unity at unitytustin.org. Email them and we'll follow up with you. Unity. Tustin, I'm sorry, unity at unitytustin.org. It's in the chat. Thank you, Jean. Uh, hearts to you. Put your hands up and say, give, yes, give somebody a high five. High five. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks.